Welcome to today's webinar. Today's title is Taking the Lead in Your Own Healthcare. It is going to be full of tips for teens and young adults. It's my pleasure to introduce Ryan Piansky, a patient advocate who is going to be giving a wonderful presentation during today's webinar. Ryan is a 20-year-old college student at the Georgia Institute of Technology. He has eosinophilic esophagitis as well as eosinophilic asthma. He follows a restricted diet as a result of some of his challenges, but despite the health issues that he has, he leads an active life. Active life. He travels, he spent a semester abroad, or at least part of it, um, and enjoys being involved in patient advocacy efforts. He has been a longtime volunteer for AppFed and a supporter of the organization's mission. He has educated lawmakers on Capitol Hill, and he has helped shape educational programming for AppFed. So without further ado, I'd love to hand things over to Ryan. Thanks, Jen. I'm excited to uh, give a presentation today. Let's see. Um, my screen should be up. So good you are good to go. Thank you so Perfect. much. Perfect. All right. Uh, so as Jen mentioned, today we'll, we will be discussing taking the lead in your own healthcare. Um, just as a bit of an outline, we're going to, I'll give you some of my background, mostly because I enjoy talking about myself, but hopefully some of that will be useful for all of you too. Uh, then we will look at how children can get involved from a young age in their healthcare. Uh, then we'll get to the transition and transfer of care from going from your pediatric doctor to an adult doctor. And then finally, when you're a young adult in healthcare on your own, how to handle prescriptions, health insurance, appointments. Um, and then towards the end, I'll give some helpful tips that I've learned over the years and provide some additional resources. Uh, before we get started, I have a quick poll for everyone. Uh, Jen, if you could put that up, that would be great. Um, and I will just give everyone a minute to, to let me know who you are. While you guys are, are filling that in, I'll mention that I'm a patient personally. I'm 21 years old, as, as Jen had mentioned. Uh, so that will be the perspective that I am providing. Uh, but it's just helpful for me to know who's out there so I can kind of mention more points based on who the audience is. Um, I'll give you guys another few seconds to answer that one. All right, so it looks like we do have a few patients out there, which is great. That's, uh, that's who we're primarily focused on. Um, we also have a few caretakers of, of teenage patients. That is also great. This should be super helpful for you as well. Um, so without, without further ado, let's get started. Um, so my background, uh, as Jen mentioned, I've been involved with AppFed for, for quite a long time. There I am at a conference off to the left with one of my doctors when I was five years old. Um, I was diagnosed with eosinophilic esophagitis when I was two years old, and I've been dealing with that ever since, and I've been pretty involved with AppFed ever since. Um, more recently, I've, I've taken up a role of patient advocacy efforts, uh, so, so there I am uh, also on the left in 2019 speaking on a panel at one of our conferences. Um, around that time, I was also diagnosed with eosinophilic asthma, uh, which I was able to get treated for, so since then I've been able to uh, lead a much healthier lifestyle and be a lot more active since my, my disorders are being treated. Uh, so there I am doing an obstacle course race and traveling to Greece as part of my study abroad program before that got cut short by COVID. Um, and if you are interested in traveling while chronically ill, uh, there was a great webinar a few weeks ago on that exact topic, so you can go and check that out. Um, but just, you know, the basics of my background, eosinophilic esophagitis and eosinophilic asthma, I have been seeing doctors for a very, very long time, and I have been very involved with the medical community throughout uh, the last decade or so. So I am pretty familiar with this stuff. Uh, I grew up in Georgia, 
So what I will be talking about is pretty specific to the rules in Georgia and the healthcare system in Georgia. Um, I've also been on private insurance. I'm on my mother's insurance plan. Um, so for those of you out there who are on Medicare and Medicaid, what I will be saying won't necessarily line up with uh, what you're familiar with, but we do have some resources at the end if you're in a different circumstance. Um, so starting from a young age, it's, it's great if you can get a child involved in their care early. Uh, and the best way to do that is to encourage them to share what they're feeling, how they're viewing their disorder, how their day-to-day -day lives go, what they're experiencing and how they're perceiving that. So when you're sitting down with a doctor, you know, as a parent and you have the patient in the room with you, if as a parent, you're just talking directly to the doctor, that can be very isolating for the child. So just taking time to ask questions to the child as, as a doctor or as a parent and have them share their experience is incredibly helpful and will encourage them to be a lot more engaged moving forward. Um, you know, as a parent, it might seem a lot easier and more efficient to talk directly to the doctor and say, oh, he has trouble swallowing or he can't eat meat. That seems to cause a lot of problems for him. He chokes a lot. You know, that, that may be true and that might be a quick way to go about it. But if your child feels comfortable, you know, saying to the doctor, I, I do have trouble swallowing sometimes and if they can think through it and associate that with the times they eat meat, then that's going to be really helpful moving forward. That's going to give the child the tools to express themselves and to be comfortable talking with their doctor and lining up their daily experiences with something that the doctor is going to find useful. Uh, moving past that a little bit, you know, when you're talking to the nurse, when you first get to the doctor's appointment, it's, it's really helpful if your patient, your child knows their basic info. So their allergies, um, that's something that they should know anyways, right? They're having to avoid their allergies daily uh, when they're out in the real world. Um, but if they can, you know, sit down and talk to the nurse and say, oh, I'm allergic to these things specifically, that shows that they're, you know, engaged with their own chronic illness. So that's a, it's a really helpful thing to encourage from a young age. Um, likewise, medicines, that's something that they're taking daily. So if if you can encourage your child to be aware of the medicines that they're taking, you know, they're not just taking the handful of pills that you give them, but if they're aware of what they're taking, that's going to be useful. It's just going to teach them that it's important to know what their care entails and how to express that to others in the medical field. Uh, and then, you know, other basic info. Ideally, your child is, is growing a lot when they're young, um, so the height and weight might be changing a lot, but if a child is just, you know, aware of how they're doing, how they're feeling, um, and some of their their basic information, like their height and weight. That again, just really uh, builds this relationship with the, the medical field, where they know what's important to share with a doctor, and they're able to keep track of that themselves. Um, towards the end of a doctor's appointment, if you're if you're talking with your doctor, uh, you're going to be making some decisions, and as a parent and as a doctor, it's really easy to you know, decide what's best for the patient. And, you know, quite frankly, the doctor probably does know what's best. And it's important to have that medical expertise and to listen to that medical expertise. Um, but involving a child in the decision making process from a young age is also incredibly helpful. Um, discussing the outcomes and possible treatment plans is something that will encourage the patient to, to be involved, to feel like they do have a say in their healthcare and feel like they can be involved in their healthcare. Um, so, you know, while a child might say, oh, you know, I just want to eat ice cream all the time, that's, that's my treatment. You know, that's not necessarily going to be the treatment to go with, but it's helpful to, you know, sit down, acknowledge that the child has their own life, their own quality of life that they want to maintain and understand how that can work with the possible treatment plans that are viable uh, for, for the specific medical case. Um, all this really boils down to the main point, which is listen, listen to your child, uh, hear what they're telling you, hear how they're feeling, hear what they want uh, from their care and engage them in the conversation. The more engaged that they are from a young age, the more willing that they're going to be as they get older to stay engaged and to take on a larger part of, of their healthcare. Um, so listen, that's, that's the main point from this slide. Uh, as you get a little older, 
um, as a patient, as you get older, as you get into the teenage years, it's important to get more involved. Um, there's going to be some information for parents on here as well, since I know there are a lot of parents out there. But before we get into this, uh, Jen, I think we had a second poll, if we could pull that one up. So appointments. Um, let's, uh, I just, I just want to see who out there is, is scheduling their own appointments. If, uh, if you're a patient, do your parents schedule your appointments for you? Do you call in and do that? Caretakers who are on the call, are you still scheduling appointments? Um, I'm at the point where I am scheduling all of my appointments and that's never fun. You know, it's, it's a real nuisance to have to call in, to find a time that works for everyone, to sit on hold. So I understand how frustrating that can be, but I want to see where everyone else is at. Give everyone just another, another minute to fill that out. All right, let's see. Okay, I can't see the results for that one, Jen, but, oh, there we go. Um, all right, so we have, we have some patients out there who are scheduling their own appointments. Good for you. It's a pain, but I'm, I'm glad you guys are doing that. Uh, and we have some caretakers who are still scheduling the appointments and that's okay too. Um, and we have a few people in between, but uh, let's, going off of that, teenagers who are on the call and parents as well. Um, as your teen is getting older, as your patient is getting older, uh, they should be scheduling their own appointments. Um, it's, let me, let me rephrase that. Um, if they're still seeing a pediatric doctor, they are not allowed to schedule their own appointments, at least in Georgia. So the parents or caretaker will need to be on the phone with them. But it's really helpful if the patient themselves uh, can be engaged in that process to understand what's going on outside of the doctor's office and to be willing to, you know, sit down on the phone, talk to the nurses in the office, talk to the administrative staff, and make sure that their schedules are appoint that their appointments are scheduled uh, during times that work for them. Um, so patients out there, as you're getting older, start thinking about these things, think about scheduling your appointments, think about what works for you during the week with school. Um, and, you know, I know personally, I have a lot of different doctors. I have to schedule a lot of appointments and I have to make sure those don't overlap. If I have like a, some time that's free, I need to make sure I can see all of the doctors that I need to see. So that's, that's our big point on the side. Start making your own appointments, start getting just a little bit more involved in the process. Um, part of that is also knowing your own medical history. Um, so again, this kind of carries on from what we were talking about before. The stuff that you interact, da interact with daily, you really should have that information uh, tied down. So your allergies, you know what you're avoiding in your day-to-day -day life. That's gonna be something that's important to bring up with your doctor. So you should be able to tell your doctor what you're allergic to. Uh, likewise, the, the medicines that you're currently taking. Those are things that you're, you know, you're taking every morning, you're taking every night. You should know what those are. You know, even if you don't know the generic name, if you only know the prescription name, some way of, of getting that information across to the doctor or nurse, just the, the medicines that you're taking. And if you can tell them why you're taking that, what that's treating, um, that's even better. I have, like I said, I have a bunch of doctors and they all prescribe me different medicines. So if I see one doctor and I mention some medicine uh, that they didn't prescribe, I need to be able to tell them why I'm taking that, which doctor prescribed that, and, and what its intention is, like what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, so that's something that you should start thinking about when you're going to a doctor. Um, also something else is, you know, your past prescriptions and treatments. Uh, if, you're, if you're seeing a new doctor or if your existing doctor recommends some treatment or some medicine that you recognize, you should be able to say, oh, we tried that in the past here's what happened, here's why we didn't go that route. Um, and you know, your doctor might say, that's, that's great, I've, I've read that in your record, I remember that, here's why I wanna try again. But it's important to be aware of your own past medical history, um, just cause that gives you a better 
launching point to move forward. It allows you to not, you know, repeat things unnecessarily. Um, that's going to be a little more complicated. You might not remember everything you took when you were little. I know I don't, um, but it's a helpful point to start thinking about what's happened before versus where you are now. Um, along those same lines, former hospitalizations and surgeries, uh, you know, you might not be able to remember all of that, but if you can have a record of that somewhere, that's incredibly useful being able to say, oh, you know, I was, I was hospitalized in 2007 for, for this specific thing and this is how they treated it. Um, that's something that your doctors might need to know. Uh, so being aware of that and, you know, practicing on your, your pediatric doctor, that can be helpful if you can go into your pediatrician and say, oh, you know, I, I, here's my hospitalization record and your pediatric doctor might be able to double check that. Um, finally, diagnoses. This kind of gets back to that daily thing. You should know uh, what kind of medical illness that you have. You should be able, you know, you don't need to be able to explain it perfectly, but you should be able to know what you have, what the symptoms are. That way, when you do talk to a doctor, if you're like, oh, you know, I have eosinophilic esophagitis and I have a lot of trouble swallowing, but those two aren't related. That's not gonna be helpful for anyone. You, sh you should be aware that, you know, trouble swallowing is a symptom of eosinophilic esophagitis. And since you have eosinophilic esophagitis, maybe that's a sign that your treatments aren't working, right? If you're having trouble swallowing. So just an awareness of, of your own medical health. Uh, again, being more aware of that as you get older becomes really important. Uh, Next up, this is kind of for parents and patients. The patient, the teenage patient, should be the primary person handling their own appointment. When you're sitting down with the doctor, the doctor is there to help the patient. And it's, you know, it's so easy as a parent to step in and be like, oh, I'm concerned about these things. This is what I've observed. I've been watching him for like, you know, the last 15 years. I know what he looks like when he's healthy and he hasn't looked like that recently. That might seem easy and efficient and it gets the message across to the doctor really easily, but you're there for the patient. Um, and if you want the patient to be able to handle their own appointments going forward, this is the time to practice. So patients, this is for you to do. When you sit down with the doctor, even before you sit down with the doctor, you know, talk to your parents, be like, I'm gonna handle this one. If I have questions, if I have notes, um, I'll ask you. And the, the parents should really be in a supportive role here. So, you know, parents, as the doctor and patient are having a conversation, um, you know, take notes, write down any questions that you might have, uh, write down any corrections that you might have. And then after the doctor and patient have been able to have a conversation, at that point, you can step in and say, oh, you know, he said that he hasn't been choking recently, but actually I've noticed that he's, he's had a lot of trouble you know, swallowing chicken. So like that is something that we should address, um, you know, because as a patient, you might just not have noticed that. And you can, you can ask any follow-up questions at the end as a parent. Um, but really primarily by the time you have a, a teenager going to a doctor's office, it is so helpful as a teenager to be able to practice, to be able to get used to communicating with a doctor and to, to be the one handling those appointments, to feel as if though your healthcare is really focused on you and that you are very, very involved. Um, this point is, is a little less uh, important. It, it's very important. Uh, my mom made me put this one in. Uh, when you turn 18, your pediatrician is no longer legally allowed to contact your parents if a medical issue arises or with any medical test results. Um, so when you turn 18, if you're still seeing your pediatrician, update your communications info. Make it clear that in case of an emergency, the, the pediatrician, any of your other doctors are still allowed to contact your parents. They're allowed to contact them regarding, you know, health results, prescriptions. Um, it's, it's an important point. It might not feel important, but you do, you want your parents and caretakers to remain in the loop. They've had a lot more experience uh, with your care um, on the administrative side. So if, if they can be contacted, if you're comfortable with them being contacted, it is important to update your communications info so that the people in charge know that they're allowed to contact your parents. Um, again, that might be Georgia specific. I don't know the rules in other states, but here in Georgia, when I turned 18, I needed to make it clear that my parents could still be contacted regarding my health. So now that you're a teenager, you've, uh, you've practiced with your pediatric doctor and you're ready to switch to an adult doctor. 
Um, this can be a little intimidating. The adult side of things is very different, at least where I'm from the pediatric side. Um, so it's, it's helpful if you can get some names from your current doctor. Uh, your current doctor knows who you are. They know your specific medical illnesses um, and they know your personality. They know how you interact with your health and with them as a doctor. Uh, so, you know, ask your doctor who their counterparts are practicing the same medicine on the adult side. And they'll be able to recommend some great names for you. Um, and they will be able to, to get in touch with them. So if you schedule an appointment with someone on the adult side, your pediatric doctor should be able to send a copy of your medical records over to them. That way they're on the adult side, they're caught up. They are ready to, you know, start working with you uh, to, to continue your treatment. Um, it's not helpful if you just, you know, go somewhere totally new, find an adult doctor, and they have no clue about your medical past, and you don't tell them, right? Uh, so it's, it's important for your adult doctor to have a copy of those pediatric records. Um, on that same note, ask for a copy. Um, if you just ask for a complete copy of your pediatric records, uh, they will give that to you. It will be a lot, like, like a lot. It'll have all of the administrative stuff, all of the bills, all sorts of nonsense. Um, so what's really helpful to ask for is to ask for notes from your doctor's appointments ask for records of hospitalization, ask for records of surgeries. Um, you can ask for past prescriptions. Uh, just narrow down what you're trying to get from your pediatric doctor. Um, but you know, here in Georgia, it's like seven or 10 years or something that healthcare systems are required to hold on to medical records. So if you leave your pediatric care and like 10 years down the line, you realize that there's some information that you want from them, they might not have it anymore. So as you're leaving your pediatric doctor, it is helpful to ask for a copy of those records. Um, and then if you do go see a new adult doctor, you can make sure that whatever information they're working off of is correct. It's the same as the information that you now have and that you're working off of. Um, on that note, this is, this is it. This is like the big important thing for this whole webinar. Um, prepare a one page summary. You know, talk to your doctor, talk to your parents, talk to your caretakers, but get a one page summary put together that just lists, um, you know, your diagnoses, your surgeries, your hospitalizations, your medicines, your past medicines, your allergies, just condense it all down, get it on one page, just like a super condensed version of who you are as a patient. That will be so helpful for all of your doctors going forward. Um, I say work with your pediatric doctor because doctors have, have their own way of speaking going on. They know what all of the different words mean. They can make it real condensed. So if you talk to your pediatric doctor and you say, here's my, my version of things, this is what I've remembered and I'm putting it in you know, normal words that I can understand, that's great. You can hand it to your pediatric doctor and they could be like, oh yeah, that medicine, you know, this is a different way of saying it. That's a much more condensed way or your G-tube surgery was actually called this specifically. So let's put that down. Um, and then you keep up with that, hopefully. You keep up with your one-page summary. You keep updating it as you, you know, as you get hospitalized again, or as you have new surgery, or as you start a new medicine. Um, you keep up with that. And then when you go to a new doctor on the adult side, you can sit down with them. If they haven't had the chance to go through all of your records yet, you can hand them the one-page summary. And that's pretty much all that they're going to need to know to work with you. Um, so that is incredibly helpful. That's why it's in red, you know, put together a one page summary. We do have uh, in the resources, we have a link to a little outline for one. Um, so that is incredibly helpful. Um, when you do get to the adult side with your little one page summary, don't be afraid to meet a handful of doctors. Um, if you If you start with one doctor and you just you don't get along well with them, they don't seem like they're listening, that's, that's fine. You can go and see a different doctor. Um, you can meet with a few different ones, decide you know, which GI doc that you like best, and then you can go forward and continue seeing that one doctor. Um, but having that one page summary will make it so much easier to be able to sit down with a lot of different doctors and have a meaningful conversation right from the start. Um, this is sort of related to the one page summary, a, a little different. Um, Bring along information on your disease. You know, here at AFED, we deal with a lot of very rare disorders. Um, so eosinophilic asthma specifically, that's, that's pretty new. We're still learning a lot about it. 
um, it's pretty rare. So if I just go and see a new asthma doc, I cannot be sure that they're going to understand, you know, what my treatments are, what my disease is. Um, so it's really helpful to bring along existing information that way your doctor can get caught up to speed. Um, Atfit.org is it's a great website. We have a lot of pages about all of the different diseases that we work with. Uh, so you can you can point your doctor to that. We also have some educational material for doctors online. Um, so it's just it's important that your doctor understands the disorder that you're specifically dealing with. That way they can make sure that to help you. If they know about something similar, that might not be good enough. So make sure that your doctor is aware of your specific uh, disorder. All right, so you've been a teenager, you've switched over to the adult side. Now, as a young adult, managing your healthcare. Um, this, is, this is sort of the step I'm at. I'm only 21, I've been on the adult side for a couple of years now. Um, it's not, it's, uh, it's complicated. It, it, truthfully, it's complicated. Um, a way to simplify everything is to sign up for the patient portal. I think most major medical systems do have some version of the patient portal. This is a great place to see your active prescriptions, request uh, prescription renewals, send messages to your doctors, see your lab results, see upcoming appointments. It's incredibly helpful if your doctor offers a patient portal to sign up for it. If you're not sure, ask your doctor, see if they do have a patient portal that you can sign up for. Uh, this comes off of the teenage thing, making your own appointments. Um, we're gonna get a little more specific. You have to actually go to your appointments. Uh, it can be easy to forget. I like never put things in my calendar, which is not great, but know when your appointments are, make sure that you make it to your appointments, figure out how you're going to get to your appointments. Do you need to borrow a car? Do you need to get an Uber? Um, but really do make it to your appointments. You need to see your doctors, even if your parents aren't standing over your shoulders saying, you gotta go to the doctors, you do. You have to go see your doctors. Um, on a similar note, you have to be persistent. Um, I'm getting, I'll tell you a little story about what I mean about that. Um, earlier this year, I had an appointment with my doctor in May and he canceled it uh, like a month ahead of time. I was like, all right, that, that's weird. So I called back and I rescheduled and I rescheduled it for, you know, like June. It got canceled again. So I had to call in and they rescheduled it for August. I was finally able to see him in August. Um, so if if your appointment's canceled, that does not mean that you do not need to go see the doctor. It just means that some administrative stuff is happening behind the scenes. Your doctor probably isn't happy about it either. You're not gonna be happy about it, but you do need to go see your doctor. Uh, so, so be persistent, make sure you get an appointment, make sure you go to your appointment. Um, when you're at your appointment, if you need prescriptions to be refilled or renewed, ask for that. Um, you have to know where your doctor needs to send that prescription. You need to know when that prescription needs to be submitted. Um, you know, at home, you need to make sure you're refilling your prescriptions in a timely manner. It doesn't help if you like take you know, your last pill on Sunday night and then Monday afternoon, you call to get it refilled if you have to take it again Monday night, right? You, you don't wanna be uh, behind on your prescriptions. So when you're a week out from running out of medication, that's when you should get your prescriptions refilled. And as a young adult, you gotta make sure you're staying on that. Um, when you're talking to your doctor, ask them a lot of questions. Um, it's confusing. It, there, there's a lot out there, uh, a lot of different treatments, a lot of different medications. So ask questions, make sure that you understand what the plan is for your specific disorder and for your care. Um, having an emergency care plan in place uh, this, this is a big one. This is slightly outside the scope of, of talking to your doctor, but it is pretty related. Um, so, you know, if you're at college, if you're in a dorm, make sure that you have an EpiPen nearby. If you have anaphylactic reactions, make sure that your roommates know to call your parents if you get sick or which ER to take you to if, if you have a preference in your area. Uh, just having some plan in place in case you get sick is an important part of being an adult. You can't just you know, move to the middle of nowhere as, as a really sick person and have no plan of getting care if you need it, right? Um, this is a similar note to what we were talking about before, uh, but updating your emergency contact information. Um, as an adult, no other adults have a right to your medical information unless you 
make it clear that that is okay. So make sure that your adult doctors, if you're comfortable with them talking to your parents or caretakers, make sure that they have the information and that they know that they are allowed to contact your parents and caretakers. Similarly, at college, when I, when I moved to college, um, I had to make it clear that like, if an emergency came up, the college was allowed to contact my parents. Uh, if, you, if you get sick and you know, the RA or the hall person has to drive you to the ER and you have not signed any form along those lines, they will not contact your parents and your parents might not be able to help you. Um, and I, I promise that your parents will want to help you if, if you get sick. Um, they've been involved with your care for a long time. And if you want them to continue to be involved, these are the steps that you have to do to, to make sure that they can be involved. Along those lines, that one page summary we were talking about before, those are super useful to have in an emergency. I have an emergency med kit here at school with me. It's just up there um, on a shelf. It has you know, my EpiPens, it has a feeding pump, it has uh, amino acid formula, um, it has all sorts of stuff, inhalers, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it also has my one page summary in there. So if I get sick and someone has to take me to the ER, I can grab that one page summary. And when I'm seen by someone, I can show them that piece of paper and be like, here's everything about me. You know, here are the medications I'm on in case they have to avoid certain things based on what I'm on. Here are my diagnoses. I also, and this is extremely useful uh, when you're an adult, have a list of all of my doctors um, on my one page summary. I have their offices and their phone numbers on that piece of paper. So when I get to the hospital, if I'm, you know, I'm having trouble swallowing, then the ER doc can call my GI doc um, and talk to them and see what the solutions are going to be for me. Uh, most importantly, stay in care. Um, this kind of goes back up to making it to your appointments, right? Um, it's easy to just let it slip by, right? It, it, you know, every six months you have to go to the doctor, that might seem like a real nuisance. So you might decide just not to go. That's not a good solution. Um, if you're feeling well, if you're doing well, that's probably because you're being treated and you're being treated because you're, you're staying in care and you're seeing your doctors. Um, so make sure you stay in care, deciding just all of a sudden that you do not need to be seeing a doctor anymore. Doesn't really work out. Uh, we, we've seen it a lot here at AtFed. It's not a good plan. So make sure you stay in care as a young adult, you know, make sure you're making your appointments, you're calling in your prescriptions, that you're going to see your doctors, that you're taking your medicines. Um, these are all really important points. So prescriptions, the pharmacy benefits manager, PBM and health insurance, it's a nightmare. It's like, it's bad. It's really not fun. It's very, very complicated but it's something that you're going to have to do as an adult. So make sure that you have what you need to get your prescriptions. Um, not all prescriptions are as simple as just calling your pharmacy and reading them the number from your pill bottle and asking for a refill. Um, I'm personally on a medicine that needs a prior authorization. So what this is, is basically the doctor's office has to send a letter to the pharmacy benefits manager saying like, oh, this patient actually does need this prescription, so you have to give to them. Uh, and sometimes that requires certain tests to be run. So I have to do a test every year that is necessary for that prior authorization to be sent. So make sure that you're getting that done so you can get your medicine. Um, sometimes, frequently, unfortunately, uh, this information will be sent along to the pharmacy benefits manager. They'll see it and they'll be like, nah, we don't really want to give them the medicine, even though he needs it. Um, so then you have to understand the appeals process. You say to the pharmacy benefits manager, like, hey, I do need this medicine. Can you reconsider? Uh, they'll look at everything again. And they'll be like, nah, we're still not going to do it. Then you go back to them and you say, hey, can we have a, a third party appeal? And they'll send all of the relevant information to a doctor outside of the organization. And that doctor will then look at it and be like, oh, yeah, this person obviously needs his medicine. You have to give him this medicine. It's, it's a mess. It's a very tricky process. Um, but it's an important one and understanding how to get your prescriptions and making sure you get your prescriptions is important. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, getting your prescriptions in advance is important. Uh, you don't want to call things in the night before you need them. The world doesn't work that fast, unfortunately. So, you know, call a week ahead before you run out. Um, 
Health insurance is very complicated. We're gonna talk about that a little more on the next slide. Uh, but as far as prescriptions go, um, some health insurance companies will have a preferred medication. Um, so for example, the, the one that I use that has a prior authorization, there's another similar medicine that won't work for me. Uh, so one year they were like, oh, our preferred medication this year is the other one. So we're only gonna cover that. We won't give you the medicine that you actually need. To go through the whole appeals process again it's, it's a nightmare uh, but talk to your doctor ask you know is the preferred medication this year that i'm able to get covered will that work for me do i need to go through the appeals process do i need to find a different way to get my medication um if, and you know it changes every year so you, you really do have to keep up with that and it's, it's kind of a nuisance but it is what it is um and also think about where you'll be getting your health insurance um Luckily, I'm able to stay on my mom's health insurance until I'm 26. So I have another five years on the health insurance plan that she's getting from her work. Um, if you're not able to stay on your parents' health insurance plan, uh, you know, you might be able to get it through university. I know here at Georgia Tech, I am able to get health insurance. Um, luckily, I don't have to do that. Um, and you can also get it through work. So my plan when I turn 26 is hopefully I will be working at a company that has pretty good health insurance so I can stay on, stay insured by getting onto their health insurance plan. Um, it's super complicated. I don't know everything about this yet. I'm, I'm still learning. I ask my parents a lot of questions. I ask my doctors some questions. Um, so ask for help. Uh, as, as a young adult, this is a really complicated area. So it's always important to ask for help. Insurance in general, still complicated, still ask for help. Um, before you sign up for an insurance plan, it's really great to review all of your options uh, that are available for you. I know my sister, she just started a new job and before she signed up for an insurance plan there, she sat down with my mom and they went through all of the plans being offered to see what my sister would want to sign up for based on what they covered, what the monthly premiums were. It's a really complicated process. So if you know someone who's been through it before, it's great to ask for help and just review your options before you get tied down in anything. Out of network versus in network coverage is also important. Um, and this is something that you want to be thinking about when you're looking at your insurance options. Um, if personally, like I'm, I'm near Emory University. So if Emory is in network on any insurance plan I'm on, that would be great. That means that things at Emory will be covered. I will be able to get the care that I need at Emory. But if, you know, if I'm somewhere different, that if I move and I'm still on this plan that you know covers Emory pretty well, then I might be in trouble with everything that is out of network and my insurance plan doesn't have any language about out of network coverage. Uh, so it's important to think about you know what will be covered, um, what the differences are between the one that you know has some coverage for out of network versus not. And finally, your total cost. It's important to know how much money you would spend a year on medical care. Um, now, this does not necessarily mean how much you're paying because of your insurance, but it's important to understand like the total cost of all of your medical care, all of the appointments that you have, all of the medicines you have, all of the surgeries and hospitalizations that you usually need. Having some idea of the total amount of money that your annual health care cost is important going into uh, the insurance conversation because it allows you to really look at plans that meet your needs. Um, and those will be different for everyone. I'm kind of expensive. <laughs> like I'm gonna need a pretty good insurance plan because I have like a lot of medicines I take. I have a lot of doctors I see. I have a lot of, you know, like complicated expensive medicines that I take. So it's gonna be different for everyone, but it's a very important thing to consider. Um, and understand that the monthly premium, so, you know, every month you'll be paying a certain amount in your health insurance. That does not necessarily reflect all of your costs for the year. There's going to be some out-of-pocket costs that you're going to have to pay. It's going to depend on what your insurance plan covers. It's, uh, as I said before, it's extremely complicated. I'm still learning all of this. Um, I hope I will figure it out one day. I'm not sure I will. I think it will continue to be very, very complicated, but hopefully I'll learn uh, as I go. So ask questions. Um, I believe we have some resources on AppFed about insurance. Oh, you know what, never mind, scratch that. I did put some resources at the end of this presentation about insurance uh, where you can learn some of the terminology and 
start to understand some of this and it is it's tricky to understand so it'll take some time it'll be probably a little frustrating but it is worth knowing all right so some helpful tips we'll just kind of run back through everything that we've learned so far uh, for, for parents, you want to get your kids involved early. And a great way to do that is by listening to them. If they feel as if their voices are being heard uh, in their healthcare from a young age, they will be a lot more willing to stay engaged as they go forward. Uh, as a patient, you know, if you're a kid, if you're a teen, if you're a young adult, be engaged in your healthcare. You know, the fact that you're here today shows that you're hopefully at least a little bit interested in this. And that is important. It's important to be engaged early. This impacts like a major part of your life. So the more engaged you are and the more that you're able to shape your own future, the, the better things will work out for you. Advocate for yourself is another big thing. If you're sitting down with a doctor and you know they're they're just kind of like bulldozing all of your suggestions and they're you know ignoring your past treatment options. That's not great. So you got to advocate for yourself. You have to make it clear what you want uh, in your in your care and your treatment, and find a way to make that work with the care that you need to get. The one page summary, and I was stressed this a lot earlier. I'm going to bring it up again. It is by far one of the most helpful things uh, for when you're considering transferring from pediatric to adult care, and even on the adult side, uh, just anything involved with your medical life should be on that one page summary. That way, if you see any doctor anywhere in an ER in a different country, you can you know, pull out that one page summary and be like, here is everything that I have going on. Here are all of the important people that need to know about this. Um, that will be super helpful going forward. It's been super helpful for me in the past and it, I'll continue to use it and you know, make sure you update it as new things come along. Um, it's not helpful if your one page summary is like six years out of date because that does not necessarily reflect your current medical state. Um, but that's super important. Um, finally, phone trees. Uh, uh, I'm going to mention this briefly because this, I feel like, is the most annoying part of being in charge of your own healthcare. You have to call to make appointments. You have to call to get prescriptions. You have to call just so many people. There's always a phone tree um, where you got to hit a couple buttons before you can get to anyone. Um, but here, what's important is be patient and be kind. The people on the other end of the phone, they are just doing their jobs. So you have to you have to make sure that you're you can get what you need um, without you know being mean to other people. Um, but also don't take no from someone who can't tell you yes. A lot of the people at the very, very front of the phone tree, right when you call in, they don't have the authority to tell you what you need to hear. And a lot of the times they don't even have access to all of your information. Uh, I know for one of my prescriptions, Every time I call, they cannot see any of my prescription information, even though they're supposed to be the ones who send me my prescription. So I always have to ask for one of their managers and I have to work my way up like two or three levels of the phone tree before there's someone who can see information on my prescriptions and then they're able to get my prescriptions refilled. Um, so phone trees are complicated. You're gonna have to deal with it. You're gonna have to be on the phone with people, but you know, be nice, be patient, work your way up the phone tree a little bit if you need to get an answer out of someone. Um, and then finally, some resources. Uh, CMS.gov uh, has some information on Medicare and Medicaid, if anyone is on those, because uh, that's going to be a very different experience insurance-wise from what I've discussed. Um, we also, down at the bottom there, that CMS link has some uh, vocab, basically, for, for the insurance world, you know, co-pays, co-insurance, all sorts of different things that are very confusing and that I don't understand, but it's a great way to start to understand that, to learn the language involved in insurance. And then I put some app fed links up there as well for kids, teens, adults, um, just as a, some other resources that you can look into. And then finally, I'll plug the app fed conference. It was great. We had a great time over the summer. The recordings of all of those uh, lectures are still available online and they were super informative. Um, also, this webinar series, I know we have some great ones coming up that I'm personally excited for. Um, we had a travel webinar a few weeks ago. That one was great, too. I highly recommend you check it out. And then finally, I'll mention the podcast that we do as well. Um, I'm, I've had a, a great time recording that. I'm one of the hosts, and we've talked to just some really, really interesting people on that podcast. Um, so hopefully, 
uh, some of those will give you a good start of places to, to look for more information. And I hope you guys have enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much, Ryan. It was really interesting to learn more about your personal experiences and what you've been through uh, with navigating the healthcare world and the transitions that you've gone through. I'm glad I was able to share. Hopefully, hopefully some of these tips will be helpful for others. I think they'll be helpful for a lot of people. Um, we can keep the resources up there for just a minute, um, but uh, let's start answering some of the questions that have come in. So first off, at uh, what age did you start asking questions during doctor appointments? This is a really great point and something that comes up a lot. Um, so I think I started getting really involved when I was around like nine or 10. Um, and I think being so involved with AppFed really helped me with that. I was aware of a lot that was going on in the research fields and with other patients. So I had a bit more perspective that I was able to take to my doctor's appointments and be like, oh, you know, my friend in Texas told me this about his, his treatment course. Can I do something like that? Um, so I was able to get involved at a pretty young age, uh, just thanks to my involvement with AppFit, which has been really, really great. Um, but, you know, the recommendation is kind of 12 years old uh, as like a good, good aim for when your patient, your, your child should start taking over more and more. Um, of course, if your kid is engaged from a younger age, that is fantastic. And you should absolutely encourage that and let them try and handle as much as they can from a young age. And it's also super complicated. So if your kid isn't comfortable handling things at the age of 12 and they need a few more years to kind of get accustomed to the way that healthcare works, that's fine too. You know, it's important to encourage any amount of involvement that you can um, and hopefully work the patient towards being able to manage their own health care. I know you said that there were some Georgia specific laws that determined when you could start scheduling appointments. Um, but so was it you were 18 when you started scheduling your own appointments because of the Georgia laws? Yeah. So before that, um, I would, I would you know, call the doctor's office while my mom was sitting across the table from me. We'd put the phone on speaker and I would be the one, you know, going through the steps and being like, I think I was around, you know, 16, I'd be like, oh, can I, you know, see doctor whatever on this day? And it would be like, no, he's busy. And I'd be like, can I see him on that day? And it'd be like, no, he's busy. Um, and my mom would be there and she would say at the start, like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm Ryan's mother. He can talk to you. Um, and like, that was kind of the permission that she needed to give so I can start that process and start to learn how to handle scheduling. Um, and then when you turn 18 here, you're able to you know, call in on your own because at that point you're a legal adult, so you don't need your parents' permission to for the for the hospital to talk to you. So I was able to just call my own and be like, "Hey, can I come in to stay?" And they'd be like, "No, keep asking until I found a day that worked." Um, but yeah. So another question that's coming up is about the one-page summary that you're recommending. I know that's something I do for myself as well, and I, I agree with you 100%. It is super super helpful when trying to help new practitioners understand more about you, particularly when you have um, some complex history. Uh, do you have a template or a sample or any resources? People are wanting to know like what all to include it, where to start. Absolutely, it's gonna be different for every person, um, but we have a great template on AppFed's website. I believe it was the middle link of my resources. If you go to like appfed.org slash for adults, maybe you can poke around the, the website a little bit, but we do have a sample template there and it was the middle link on my resource slide. Um, but some great things to have is like right up at the top, emergency contact info, put your parents' names and numbers. Um, also near the top, have a list of your doctors and their contact information, then get into your allergies and medications. Um, those are gonna be super helpful for you know an ER doc seeing you for the first time. If you're allergic to apples, they need to know that so they don't give you apple juice. Um, then having a list of your past surgeries and hospitalizations can be helpful, as well as a list of your diagnoses and how that presents. Um, so it's just like a rough outline, but we do have something online uh, that you can go and get a, get a quick template to start filling out. Wonderful, I think that'll help a lot of people get started. 
On the other side of organization that you've been talking about, you mentioned how important it is to stay on top of your doctor's appointments and your prescriptions. Are there any tools or apps that you use to help keep yourself organized with all of that, like follow-up appointments and prescription refills? Yeah, so I'm horrible at this. Uh, so I will I will give you the advice that I've been working off of. I've really started using my iPhone calendar because I always have my iPhone on me. So the second that I schedule a doctor's appointment, I put that in my calendar. Um, that way I get the notifications. I have it set to like an hour before the appointment. That way, if I forgot about it, I then have time to make sure I can get to my appointment in time. Um, and that's been incredibly helpful for me, uh, just making it to my appointments. Um, having that reminder just popping up on my phone, which is always on me. Um, for prescriptions, I have not found a good system yet. Um, honestly, my dad texts me every few weeks and is like, do you need any prescriptions refilled? And that's been working super well for me. But if anyone has any advice out there, I would absolutely love to hear it because I forget all the time to refill my prescriptions. Um, luckily, it has not been a problem yet. I've always noticed when I have like five or six pills left, but um, it's, it's, it's a problem for me too. So if anyone out there has advice, please let me know. Well, kudos to dad. And uh, yeah. maybe you can use your calendar in the same way. Uh, put some reminders on there as like to-do lists rather than appointments where you have to go somewhere. I think that is what I need to do. I just, I've been too stubborn so far, but I'll think about it. Um, you talked about some of the challenges that you have with getting medication approved and being able to take specific certain types of them. Um, and you talked about the phone tree. Can you talk a little bit more detail about how do you actually start the appeal process for getting a medicine approved? Yeah, so it's complicated. Uh, I found that out the hard way. Um, I, it, it was 2018 when I like first had a medicine that needed a prior authorization. And so my doctor explained that whole process to me. She said that she was going to send in the prior authorization and then I should get my medicine. And a week or so later, I got a letter from the pharmacy benefits manager saying that it was denied and that they weren't going to give me my meds. Um, so I messaged my doctor through the patient portal and I was like, what, what now, what do I do? Um, and she was fantastic. Uh, so the main point here is ask your doctor if this situation comes up, they will understand what's going on and they should be able to help you. Um, but she was like, well, essentially we, we have to resubmit this, ask for an appeals process. Um, and her staff, her nurses were able to do that. So they sent the prior authorization along uh, with my test results uh, that I needed for that medicine, as well as like my personal history. Um, so, you know, she mentioned all of the times that I've been sick recently and how this medicine specifically would help with that. Um, so she was able to submit that appeals process uh, for me. Um, I think with the help of my mother, I'm pretty sure she was involved too. She was pretty involved when I was 18. She still is, she's fantastic. Um, but that, that was how we were able to go about that um, through the doctor's office. And my doctor was able to understand everything going on and was able to submit the appropriate paperwork. Um, after we submitted that first appeals that also came back with a no from the pharmacy benefits manager. So we had to go to the third party appeals process, which was a little easier since we already had everything compiled. We just had to say we would like to request a third party appeal and the pharmacy benefits manager sent it to uh, an outside doctor who looked everything over. It was like, obviously he needs the medicine, give him his medicine, please. Uh, and, and that one worked. So it's I'm complicated. that worked out. Ask your doctor. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Absolutely. Another thing you touched on that some people have some questions about is when you are trying to find an adult doctor, how do you decide which one is the best one or right one for you? That is a very, very good point. Um, it can be hard, uh, you know, from one meeting, you might not really know if they're the right fit for you. Um, that's why I do recommend seeing a few different doctors. Uh, what I've found helpful is getting a recommendation from my pediatric doctors. Uh, you know, so from going from pediatric GI to adult GI, I asked my pediatrician GI, like, who do you recommend? Which names do you recommend, recognize on the adult side? And who do you think would be a good fit for like my style of healthcare, you know, based on the way that we interact? And he was able to provide me with, you know, two or three different names on the adult side. I went and saw the first name on the list and I really got along well with him. Um, so I was able to, you know, continue going to see him. Um, for one of my other doctors, I think I saw 
two different uh, types of that doctor on the adult side before I really felt comfortable. And, you know, the second doctor just seemed to have a much better um, concept of the specific illness I was dealing with and really understand the treatment outcomes that I was looking for. Um, so it's, it's definitely okay to see multiple doctors on the adult side before you really settle for one. Um, and it's a great idea to get a list of names from your pediatric doctors because they will know who's working on these sort of disorders on the adult side. Um, you know, if you're in a new area, I think AFID has a doctor finder online. It, it might be a little trickier if you're moving and you're having to find a new adult doctor. I've not been through that yet, so I won't comment any more on that, but um, it's always okay to talk to a few different doctors before you find one that you really like. There's certainly value in a second opinion. For sure. Another question that came in is along the lines of what we were just talking about, about the importance of advocating for yourself. And, you know, we talked a little bit about, okay, so you started talking more around age 12. Um, there is one person who's joined us today who has a son who's 14 um, and has EOE. And she's wanting to know some tips for how can she help him advocate for himself? That is a super, super great question. Um, I have been involved in the world of advocacy for like such a long time. It just it feels like second nature at this point. But I do understand that it can be intimidating um, to, you know, to not want to stand up to your doctor, to not want to say like how you're feeling, um, especially I've had doctors in the past who have just wanted to like be in and out in 10 minutes and they don't really want to have a conversation with me. And that's not helpful because, uh, you know, you are there to get help from your doctor. Um, so as a parent, it's a lot easier to, you know, say, wow, no, you're, you're here to talk to my child and to help us. Um, as a patient, that can be a little scarier. So parents, it's, it's really great that you're involved. And I was always thrilled that my mother was, you know, there to advocate for me, but it really didn't give me a lot of opportunities to advocate for myself until she took a step back. Um, so as a parent, if you can defer questions to your child, that's great. If a doctor asks you something that you know that your kid can answer, have your kid answer. And it might be uncomfortable for your son. Um, I know I never liked it when I was younger, when my mom would like have me answer questions that I didn't want to answer, but it's a really, really important part of becoming more involved in your healthcare. Um, so if, if you can do that, if you can kind of like force some questions towards your son, that I think is going to be really helpful in the long run. Um, and hopefully he'll open up to the idea more and more of being the one to just answer the questions by default. Um, so that's, that's my advice. Try and involve him in the conversation, even if he does not want to be involved. It's, it's really important uh, from as young as possible to be involved in that conversation. So even if they don't want to be, you kind of got to force them into the conversation. Some other conversations that can be challenging are ones with your friends or a colleague or a boss about medical issues that you have. Do you have any best practices or tips for people for being able to disclose that information or when to disclose that information? Yeah, so that's always complicated because, you know, there are so many different situations that come up. Um, personally, I... I don't usually bring up my, my full medical history right away. That can be really overwhelming for some people, um, especially in this community. We all deal with a lot of really rare disorders with like, we're all, we're all pretty sick and that's like never fun for someone else to hear right off the bat. Um, that being said, you should never, you know, be ashamed to share that information. If, if it's, if you're not feeling well, you need to go sit down or lie down. You should always feel comfortable saying like, wow, I'm, I'm just not feeling great right now. I'm going to go sit down for a bit. Um, that being said, you know, for friends, I'll, I'll get to know them for a bit. I'll, you know, a few weeks in allergies always comes up first. I'm allergic to some weird stuff. So they'll be like, Hey, let's, let's go. Uh, let's go to some Asian restaurant. I'll be actually I'm super allergic to rice and fish. So I prefer if we didn't do that. Um, so allergies usually come up first. And from there, I can kind of introduce my friends to this idea of eosinophilic esophagitis. I can mention the eosinophilic asthma as like a shoot off from that, um, just because they're both in the eosinophilic world. Um, and I can sort of introduce them to the concepts of my illness that they need to know. Um, 
that being said, not everyone needs to know everything about you. Like I have some other medical issues going on that, you know, my friends don't really need to know about. Um, they don't really care. It doesn't affect them. Um, and that's okay. Um, my, my roommates specifically, they do know a little bit more because uh, they have to know, like, if I pass out, like, what's in my emergency med kit that they're going to need, which hospital to take me to. Um, and so I've, I've briefed them on that. I'm like, here's my EpiPen, like, stab me if you need to. Um, for colleagues and bosses, that can be a little trickier. It's less of a personal relationship. Um, for, you know, for accommodations, you do sometimes need, don't necessarily need to tell your boss what's wrong with you, but you can go to HR. You can be like, here are the medical issues that I have. Here are the accommodations I'm requesting. And you can get that process started. Um, and then for colleagues, that's that's kind of a weird in between. Um, I've had situations with colleagues where they're like, let's go out and eat this food. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm allergic. I'll just bring my own food. I'd still like to come hang out with you. And then you can sort of get into that conversation from there. Um, but it can be a little unsettling if um, if your colleague's like super interested in your medical health. So it's also okay to just say, oh, you know, I'm not comfortable discussing that and just kind of leave it at that. No one has a right to that information. Um, so it's it's okay to share as much or as little as you would like. <laughs> it's kind of the end point there. Totally, totally respect that. Well, thank you so much for sharing such wonderful information about your experiences today. Want to kind of take a minute here to just kind of give people some additional information. And once again, thank you um, for giving the presentation today. Also want to make sure um, if anybody else has any other questions, please feel to send a note to mail at appfed.org and we'll be happy to follow up with you. Um, thank you so much to our education partners for helping to make this webinar series possible, uh, specifically to AstraZeneca, to Bristol Myers Squibb, as well as to Takeda. Also want to share some resources that we have for you to be able to get further involved and learn more about what AppFed has to offer. Um, we held a wonderful virtual conference earlier in July, and now you can go to appfed.org conference and you can access the conference on demand. Um, members of AppFed can get into the conference for free. And here's a fun tip, membership for AppFed can be free. There are free options and there's also paid options. We always appreciate the monetary and donations, um, but there are options for free so that you can get into the conference. There were over 40 presentations and there are um, research posters. There are uh, presentations from your peers. There is just such a wealth of information and even an exhibit hall to learn more about different resources in the area and the industry. Also, we had somebody ask about the podcast. Um, AppFed launched a podcast earlier this year. It's called Real Talk Eosinophilic Diseases. And as Ryan mentioned, he is one of the co-hosts. We just launched a new episode last Friday. So please go to Apple, go to Spotify, go to Amazon, subscribe to our podcast. And you can listen to the most recent episode by Devi Alves which was about self-advocating with an eosinophil disease. She is a patient advocate and she shares some of the experiences that she's been through specifically with hyper eosinophilic syndromes. Another upcoming opportunity to get involved is Little Airways Big Voices. This is a collaborative initiative that AppFed is a part of along with the other organizations you hear on the bottom of the screen. And on September 20th, we are co-hosting a virtual externally led patient focused drug development meeting. That's a tongue twister for you. But basically what we're trying to do is gather information about living with and managing asthma in childhood. And by participating in this meeting, you can help add your voice to share information with the FDA, with researchers and drug developers to help inform the future of treatments for asthma in childhood. So please check out littleairwaysbigvoices.org whether you can attend the event or you can look for opportunities to take a survey and submit comments, we'd appreciate um, if you or any of your family members or friends happen to have a child with asthma or experienced asthma in childhood, please add your voice to, to this initiative. So thank you again so much for joining us today. Again, if you have any questions, you can send us a note at mail at appfed.org and keep an eye out on appfed.org webinars for more upcoming events. Thank you.